the Essex Community College here in Haverhill, Massachusetts, where we got a foot and a half of snow over the past few days, which was a little shocking. I'm also serving as the co-president of CCCOER with Lisa Young from Scottsdale Community College. Um, Lisa couldn't make it to the webinar today, but um, so we're so glad you could make it to join us for the Open Ed and OE Global Recap and Reflections. In case you weren't able to attend the two national OER conferences this past fall in Phoenix and Milan, and we're just following them on Twitter, wishing you were there, we thought it would be nice to provide you with an overview of the conferences and to give you a chance to hear some of the highlights and ask questions. So, oops. Here is our agenda. I'm going to introduce our speakers. Oops, sorry about that. I am going to introduce our speakers, have a quick overview of CCCOER, get right into the pres presentations, and then have some time for questions and answers and make a few announcements at the end of the hour. So during the web webinar, it's best to mute your audio. Please feel free to type questions or comments into the chat. Una and Liz will be monitoring the chat throughout the hour. Um, so, See. So it's my pleasure to introduce um, Marilyn Billings. Um, Marilyn, would you like to unmute yourself, say hello and a little bit about what you do at UMass? Hi, everyone. Uh, yes, I head up the uh, Scholar Communication Office here at UMass Amherst. I've actually been working for several years now with Sue on a number of different uh, open education projects. So very excited to be here to talk with you today. Thank you, Marilyn. Um, Una? Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Leslie. So we all, we all know Una, but. <laughs> uh, all right. Uh, Una Dilling, the uh, director of CCCOER um, at the um, Open Ed Consortium. Um, but we'll be talking to you a little bit about um, some new naming that uh, has just been announced um, shortly. So thanks, Sue. All right. Thank you, Una. And um, Brittany? Brittany Dudek from Colorado. Hi everyone, I'm Brittany Dudek. I'm the library coordinator at Colorado Community Colleges Online. Um, I head up our library and our OER efforts here at the system office. And I'll be giving you a super brief uh, recap of the presentation I gave at Open Ed. All right. Thank you, Brittany. James Glapa Grosskog. Yeah, hey everybody, James here from College of the Canyons in uh, Southern California. I uh, have the distinct uh, pleasure of working with a uh, really uh, excellent team of folks here at College of the Canyons to uh, develop open textbooks and Z degrees. We are currently offering our students uh, six uh, pathways uh, built around OER. Uh, and we've got a little publishing house here pumping out uh, open textbooks and to a large extent our efforts are fueled by uh, brilliant young people and student workers so I'll be talking a little bit later about uh, the great presence of students at both the conferences. Wow thank you James and Terry Green. Um, Terry might not be on the call yet. Um, so Jen Claudini from Portland Community College. Yeah, hello everybody. My name is Jen Claudini. I'm a faculty librarian at Portland Community College. Uh, I'll be giving you the very brief recap of a presentation I gave at Open Ed this year about a professional development experience we, um, we developed for our faculty, looking at opportunities to increase increase the cultural responsiveness of curricular materials and um, accessibility using open resources and practices. All right, thank you, Jen. So as you can see, all of our speakers are both local and national leaders, and they all make amazing, they're all amazing contributors to the open education community. Um, so a little bit about CCCOER. If you're new to CCCOER, the organization has been around for about 13 years now. Is that correct, Una? I think so. Uh, 12. <laughs> 12, okay. 
Um, and CCCOER is a community of practice dedicated to promoting the adoption and development of open educational resource, resources to enhance teaching and learning. We were founded to support the community college mission of open access through creating awareness and development of openly licensed, low cost materials to make college more affordable and accessible for students um, by removing the financial barriers to them. Um, so here's a map of our membership. We have um, 90 members now, which is amazing, from 34 states. Um, and we have actually we have 15 statewide memberships and we've um, welcomed lots of new members this year. All right, so I would like to hand it over now to Una Daly, um, who will start off with a recap of both of the conferences, the Open Ed and the Open Ed Global. All right, thank you, Sue. Um... So it's been really just an amazing month. It's hard to believe, but we've had the two biggest conferences, um, open ed conferences, really within just the last month. Of course, we had open ed 2019, uh, just around Halloween, and then kind of uh, bookended with OE Global um, around Thanksgiving. So, um, and both conferences have just really been amazing. Um, in terms of um, the, the breadth of uh, work that's being done, involvement with students, um, et cetera. So um, Sue, if you could click to the next slide, that would be great. So, you know, you may know these numbers, but there were over 850 people at the Open Ed Conference in Phoenix, um, over 400, so nearly half of them were newcomers which shows that this is um, open ed is really no longer of movement. It's really an established practice now at many of our um, colleges and universities. I think for many of us, seeing students not only be a, just a keynote at this conference, but there was multiple panels and presentations that were actually run by students and by the student PERGs was really impressive. And hearing their stories, I think was, um, it was just very re-energizing for those of us who've been working on this for so long. Um, and to hear how, um, open education has helped these students, um, but these students are amazing in and of themselves and the initiative that they've taken, but open education is providing them with so many new opportunities. So um, in addition to, of course, the, that amazing conference, there was something <laughs> that, you know, I think there was the announcement by David Wiley on the very first day of the conference that to some extent um, played a big role in the conference and, and contributed to a lot of conversations um, at, during the conference and since then. Um, and he has decided to step down as the organizer after 16 years and um, put and really invite the community um, to look at next steps and to come up with a plan for um, Open Ed 2020 and beyond. So there's been a number of people who've been leading this effort to uh, get things going because it's really a very short period of time uh, between now and the fall uh, when, of 2020 when the next conference would be taking place. So there was emails that went out um, last week um, on most of the major open ed um, email um, listservs. And if you didn't receive one, please let us know. We'd be happy to send that to you. It was a letter inviting folks to participate in um, the planning for Open Ed 2020. And I've put the tiny URLs here on the, um, um, sorry, on the slide. And if somebody could put those tiny URLs in the chat window, that would be really helpful. And so the first one is a call for um, interest and how you can help with that planning and then the second url is actually just the the publishing of who has already volunteered the deadline for um, sharing your interest is december 15th so you've got a few more days um, but please do um, 
contribute um, your interest level to that if you would like to see the conference continue. And um, there was a survey done during the conference um, and a slightly beyond that, which indicated there was a really strong desire uh, by um, the community to have this continue. So, but it won't happen without all of our um, efforts. Um, next slide, please, Sue. In addition, um, at the Open Ed Conference, the day before, um, there was a number of projects that um, took advantage of having everyone come together and had these amazing pre-conference workshops. And um, LibreText and the Open Active Pathways out of Arizona um, had a pre uh, pre conference workshop as well. Um, CCCOER was able to participate. Uh, we launched a regional leaderships in open education at Glendale Community College, uh, where we shared lunch and snacks with the OER Izona conference, which was taking place at the same place. So that was really fun. And I know Lumen also had a a workshop day as well for people who are new to that. And I just wanted to give you a very brief overview of the Regional Leaders in Open Education, which is a new effort for CCCOER to really work with um, state and regional leaders around um, open education, uh, informing them, um, keeping them um, up to speed on what is happening around the country. And so there were four work groups that were established. Um, one is around policy and strategy. And, and that is that is really the one where we feel that um, statewide leaders are often reaching out for information from other statewide leaders on what's happening from a policy perspective. And we were very happy to have uh, Nicole Allen um, from Spark come and um, speak to us about some of that some of the work that they've been doing in this space and we'll continue to collaborate with them. Uh, the other uh, three areas were the professionalism of the open educator, um, which is really um, a recognition that open education is is not uh, just a um, just a movement anymore. It's really becoming an established practice. Um, stewardship of open content and data was the third one, and finally sustainability. Um, and so, and we have some amazing folks who are leading this process. And if you haven't um, been involved and would like to get involved, please contact us. Um, and our contact information is available at the end of these slides. Um, we're welcoming everyone who would like to participate in this process with us. And we'll be working on this over the next year to uh, see what direction we wanna take this in. Um, Sue, next slide, please. So the other amazing conference was the one in Milan, and that was the Open Education Global. It is the international conference that occurs um, once a year and is sponsored by the Open Ed Consortium. And there was over 250 attendees there. Um, half of those were newcomers as well. So a similar trend to open education, um, although Obviously, people from over 40 countries were attending. It was an extremely interactive um, conference. Uh, lunch was standing up and um, standing up at the at the round top tables and um, engaging with um, all these amazing people from around the world. Um, there was very few straight presentations. Most of them were around. Uh, one hour action labs, world cafes, lightning rounds, etc. And there was a, a, a very big focus on social justice and what that might mean around the world, not specifically in um, the United States or the North American context. There was also uh, a, a focus on educational technology. Um, MOOCs are a much bigger um, deal around the world than they are in the US these days. And um, so so various aspects of um, ed tech. And the, the, the two really big announcements at that conference going forward is that um, the next conference will be in Taipei, Taiwan. It'll be the week before Thanksgiving for those of you who are US based. <laughs> Uh, there'll be a Chinese language tract because there will be a lot of um, folks coming in from Taiwan um, and other parts of um, China. Uh, so we're really excited about that. And the Open Education Consortium has decided to rebrand itself as OE Global. So the conference name and um, our organization will be um, using the same uh, branding. 
So we're excited about that. And you can see some of the great folks here um, and some of the scenery um, from uh, the event in Milan. All right, next one, please, Sue. I think I've used up my five minutes. We, the um, conference opened with a student panel, uh, which was led uh, by our um, conference coordinator, Paola Cortini. Um, and the three students were from um, colleges and universities in Italy, Germany, and the US. And um, on the far left is Trudy Radke from College of the Canyons in California. We were really pleased that she could join us. Um, and um, the students were, uh, were really inspirational. They were talking about how they were organizing other students, um, how they were involving faculty in uh, their own advocacy efforts, um, and it, just really a, an impressive group of students. Um, all right, um, next, um, next slide, please. And finally, I wanted to mention the OE Awards of Excellence. So um, the Open Ed Consortium, now OE Global, um, does these awards of excellence every year. And there was over, over 17 individual, I'm sorry, project awards. And there was um, about five or six individual awards that were given at this conference. Are, they're awarded throughout the year, but um, I think you see a few people here that you might recognize. So we had uh, James Clapper Grossclegg um, was receiving uh, two awards actually. So, um, and we have the Open Geography uh, Award that went to Adam Dastrup at Salt Lake City. We had Dave Dillon receiving one uh, for his blueprint textbook. Dave is from San Diego, from Grossmont College. Um, we had Terry Green um, up at eCampus Ontario, now at Fleming College uh, for the patch I think it's the Patch Books faculty book. Um, uh, we had Oasis Geneseo um, receiving that. That was Billy Jones. And finally, we had the uh, FET, the, um, the FET simulations out of um, Colorado, University of Colorado Boulder also received um, Open Ed Awards of Excellence. Many more people did too. Uh, I thought you might actually know these folks though. So I wanted to share that. And I think, is that my last slide? Yes, so thank you everyone. Um, and we'll have a little discussion at the end if people wanna talk a little bit more about those, um, about the conference and what happened at, at all of those. So thank you, Sue. Thank you, Una. And I think we, we're all looking for ways to increase our travel budgets for next year. Um, congratulations to all of the award winners, that's awesome. So now I'd like to turn it over to Jen Claudini and she's going to um, share a recap of her presentation from the Open Ed Conference. Yes, hello everybody. I'm happy to give you the, the whirlwind here. Um, my name is Jen Claudini. I am a faculty librarian at Portland Community College in Oregon. Um, this is a large multi-campus urban community college with a diverse student body. Uh, I've been coordinating our more official institutional OER initiative for the past, I think it's five, maybe six years, five or six years. I coordinated a different uh, OER initiative at a, at a different community college before that. Um, so here at, at PCC last year, uh, I was able to develop a, a, a different professional development experience for faculty that I wanted to tell you about, the Equity and Open Education Faculty Cohort. Um, we'd had in our beginning years uh, pretty good success with getting folks' attention about the cost of textbooks and how open resources could mitigate some of those costs. But um, probably like a lot of you, I was having the experience where um, I didn't feel like folks were uh, quite familiar enough with the opportunities that open provide instructors to, to transform their curriculum. Um, there was a lot of focus on cost and not a lot of focus on um, using uh, open resources to transform our teaching. So I wanted to think about ways to expand that. Okay, next slide. Additionally, we really have a focus on incre increasing and improving the cultural responsiveness of our teaching here at PCC. Not to say that uh, we don't have a long way to go, probably like many of you. But I was really interested, our, our OER team is really interested in helping folks think about how they could use open resources to really bring in our student voices. We felt like 
The voice is represented not only in commercial textbooks, but also in open textbooks um, were largely white. There was a lot of ableism represented there. And we wanted to think about ways that we could involve our students in the creation and curation of uh, course materials so that those voices and perspectives could be represented. Next slide. We were able to fortunately apply for some one-time special projects funding and the open education, the equity and open education faculty cohort was born. Uh, this was a two-part professional development experience. Part one, we asked instructors to uh, engage with open resources, basics, OER basics and copyright basics, uh, culturally responsive teaching, universal design and open pedagogy. We called part one explore. The idea was that folks would look at some resources that we uh, gathered and then have some conversations about it and how it applied, about how those concepts might be applied to their teaching. Um, I'll tell you that in order to design this um, experience, I felt like it was really important. I have a lot of experience in open resources. I'm super committed to social justice and increasing cultural responsiveness in teaching, but I did not feel like an expert. So I uh, spoke with, uh, there is a lot of expertise around our college and I involved folks from the Office of Diversity, Equity and Inclusion, other folks who had a lot of experience teaching social justice concepts. Um, I engaged them in the creation of, this, of the materials and I was, I'm so fortunate to have a really fantastic and engaged disability services director who co-facilitated a, a week of content on universal design. So part one, we asked folks to consider these concepts. And then part two, uh, we call it implement. We asked folks to take some of the concepts that they learn and then look at a two week chunk of their curriculum and, um, and, uh, and employ some of these ideas to, to transform a piece of their curriculum. Okay, next slide. So we had a total budget of $22,000. We were able to move 44 faculty through our part one explore. We provided a $200 stipend for folks who just wanted to complete that explore component. Um, we had $300 stipends for those who opted to implement some of the components that they learned from the explore part into their curriculum. So some folks did only part one, some folks did part one and part two. Um, and we also had some development hours included in that budget. Next. Here's a quote from someone who completed both components. This really sank to the heart, I think, of the success of this experience. The value in using OER goes beyond cost savings. When I began this cohort, the cost saving was the only thing on my mind. I saw this alone as an effort toward equity for students. Now I understand there are many ways that using Creative Commons materials can help me work toward equity in the classroom. This is from Alexi McKee, a biology instructor. She struggled a little bit on her implement component for a marine biology class, but she talked to me later and said that she was so um, enthusiastic and encouraged, even after putting in some hard work, that she had transformed uh, the curriculum for several of her biology classes and was looking into doing more. Alrighty, that next slide is the last one. Um, the whole curriculum that I developed for this professional development experience is licensed under a CC BY, Creative Commons BY. You're welcome to take it and implement it. It lives on a Google site. Here's the URL for that Google site. Um, I have, we're working here in Oregon to try to get some state funding to offer it on the state level. Um, but I'd really uh, love to help anybody who's um, interested in taking this experience and adapting it or applying it in your own context. I think I'm done. Wow, thank you so much, Jen, for sharing that with us. Um, that looks like a great model, and I'm sure you're, you're going to get a lot of interest in um, the site and the materials that you develop, because um, they're always, Great and high quality. Thank you. Um, so now I am going to turn it over to um, Marilyn Billings and she's going to talk about the um, Massachusetts Open Education Achieving Access for All project.
Great, thank you very much. Um, let me just first start by saying that uh, I started our open education program back in 2011. And four years ago, I was part of a team that started a whole regional open education conference program. And that's kind of how this started up, was having a regional program to get some of the local people really jazzed about open education, including the Massachusetts Department of Higher Ed. So they came to one of these programs and said, oh, you've got to apply for our particular grant that we have at that time called a, uh, a PIF grant. And so it's a collaborative, what we had was a collaborative grant project that was funded by, by the Department of Higher Ed. And it was uh, pitched by us and then run by four of the public higher ed institutions in Massachusetts. Uh, the team included two community colleges, one of the state universities, and then the UMass Amherst campus. And what was great about this particular team is that it really represented all three segments of public higher education in our state and the various regions across the state. And on the next slide, you'll just see a graphic depiction of the state of Massachusetts. If Sue can forward that slide, there we go. And you'll see all the community colleges there in yellow, the state universities in red, and uh, UMass campuses in, in the blue there. So we really cover a, lot, a large expanse within the uh, state of Massachusetts in the US. So then if we go on to the next slide, um, I wanna talk a little bit about what some of the goals were of this grant that we applied for and received. Uh, we wanted to really raise the total awareness of open educational research resources throughout the in entire uh, higher education landscape. Uh, to build capacity for doing this work in undergraduate higher ed. And we have a whole program here where that's called the Massachusetts uh, Transfer Block. And those courses are those that students in the community colleges can transfer uh, into the state universities and the University of Massachusetts system. And so we wanted to focus on that particular area and also provide professional development opportunities by workshops and course creation. And in the process of doing all this, uh, we were addressing the big three statewide priority objectives within our entire uh, state, which includes access and affordability, retention, student retention and success, and graduation rates. And I'm sure all of you know how that just goes across to all of higher education, actually. So then if we go on to the next slide, so what did we want to do in order to figure out how to assess this landscape? And it was to create a survey. And so we took some of the survey elements based on our, the work that uh, Sue Tashin and some of her colleagues had done in a, one of the Go Open projects and also looked at some of the other surveys that we knew of and created a survey that would um, help us in figuring out the knowledge capacity of the various institutions, what they were doing currently, and then identify training needs if we wanted to go ahead and do uh, workshops and develop some of these materials for future use. So we sent this out to the chief academic officers of all of the 28 publics in the state in the fall of 2018. And uh, it was completed by various OER people that was either librarians, instructional designers, and sometimes it was a faculty member or, so, or some administrators. So it really ran the gamut of those types of people. We received uh, responses from 100% of the colleges and universities with a little bit of prodding, obviously, <laughs> to get that kind of baseline that we really wanted to have for future work with open education throughout our entire state. So then Sue, if you'd advance, there we go. So when we took a look at that one, the first objective really was to do these uh, regional training workshops. There were five of them. They were considered to be uh, professional development opportunities for faculty, librarians, uh, instructional designers, other staff, administrators, things of that nature. So we had some really baseline uh, programming that we did on finding open educational resources, you know, what really are they, um, strategies for increasing their adoption, 
uh, getting how to get started with them and really had a wonderful session by one of our uh, instructional designers in the state on accessibility of course materials because we wanted to start right off with that from the get-go uh, sessions on you know the use of open licenses creative commons licenses in particular and then followed that up with some Q&A and some general kinds of sessions based on some of the feedback that we've received from that uh, survey instrument. Part, then the latter part of that day, we um, focused on the faculty asking them to review an, an open textbook in their field. Uh, we had a particular rubric that we were following and for those faculty who completed the survey, we, uh, I mean the attended the uh, training and the review of the textbook, they got their uh, $200 stipend. So that, that was pretty successful. The chance opportunities are that, you know, those particular faculty will be more apt to adopt an open education textbook into the future. So then our next objective was really to develop this course development day. And our focus was on those high enrollment courses that were in that Massachusetts transfer block that I mentioned earlier. And knowing that these materials were available through OpenStax, Open Textbook Library, and some other places, what we had heard from the survey, and obviously we've all heard, is that faculty really need to have additional ancillary materials, whether it's PowerPoint slides, textbooks, et cetera, I mean, um, test banks, et cetera, those kind of things. So. Um, that was the goal was to get together the uh, faculty from throughout the entire higher education spectrum. So that was interesting too because they were people that had never worked together before. They picked a particular course that they wanted to work on, say it might be biology or economics or math or something and work together in small teams. We hired a um, facilitator from OpenStax who'd had some previous experience with this and um, that led to the creation of a lot of materials that will be going up on OER Commons in the relatively near future. And for those faculty who completed this, all of this work, they received a $1,000 stipend for that work. So keep going with that. So then uh, let me just tell you now the finances. So what we received from the Massachusetts Department of Higher Education was a $150,000 grant for the uh, 28 public higher education institutions. The cost of the regional workshops and all the work that went into that, including you know, the, all the various expenses involved, was about $16,000. The course development day with a facilitator and all the other pieces that came to it along with the stipends for the faculty members was over 53,000. And then uh, because we actually ended up having fewer faculty complete their work, that was one of the things that we are challenges that we're going to have to address in the future if we decide to do this again was that um, we had some additional monies left over so we decided that we would become members of the open textbook network and ask them to provide us with some additional services going forward with faculty stipends and things like that so that'll be happening over the next couple of years actually but the really excellent news was that our projected student savings just based on the courses that we did uh, work on is 631,000 in the very first year. Raised a lot of awareness throughout the whole state on this and I think we've really whetted the appetite of the folks that are here. Um, we this year will start having a Massachusetts Open Education Resources Advisory Group. That group has not started yet. Uh, and we have some other things that are going to be happening into the near future that you'll be hearing about in future webinars, I'm sure. And I also wanted to share what our resources page is here on our screen that maybe Sue can post into the chat window. So thank you all very much. Thank you very much, Marilyn. Um, and I'll say that working um, with this statewide collaboration this year was one of um, one of my best experiences um, working in OER so far, um, having all three segments working together, it was really great. We really learned a lot about um, the needs of the different faculty at different um, universities, state colleges, and community colleges. 
All right, so now I would like to introduce Brittany Dudek, who's the Library Coordinator at Colorado Community Colleges Online. Um, right. Brittany? Great. Hi, everyone, again. Um, so we have um, done a preliminary research project into the impact of zero textbook cost courses on our student performance metrics. Um, we have over 84 zero textbook cost courses um, with two Z degrees, and we're working on another one. Um, so if you want to move to the next slide. Um, we wanted to know, given um, some of the unique parameters that CCC Online operates under, um, is there any effect um, with zero textbook cost course materials? So CCC Online operates with a centralized course design model um, using master courses, meaning that we design um, one English 121 course, for example, um, that is uh, designed with assignments, discussions, um, pretty much everything kind of packaged together, and then um, we duplicate that out for however many sections we need. Um, we also are a Quality Matters institution, and all students have access to materials on day one, even if our courses are not OER or zero textbook cost. Um, we are not a um, inclusive access institution, um, but we do use primarily I think all but two or three of our courses have digital integrations um, and we use a variety of vendors to do that. So um, our model provides a really excellent uh, sample of courses um, to test the effects of zero textbook cost courses on our on, um, student um, success rates. So you can go to the next. So what we did was we looked at um, all of our courses that were zero textbook cost, um, and then we identified which ones were taught for three consecutive semesters using traditional publisher materials, and were taught for three consecutive uh, semesters using zero textbook cost courses. Um, so that might be a summer, fall, spring, a fall, spring, summer, um, a spring, summer, fall, whatever that looks like, but it was three consecutive semesters of both traditional and then three consecutive semesters as zero textbook cost. Um, so while I mentioned that we did have 84 courses, um, looking at those parameters of three consecutive semesters, um, only um, 12 courses were eligible for assessment. Um, we did have 20 courses that technically met the parameters, um, but they, um, this is the shortened version of the presentation, um, so only 12 of them were actually available um, for this. We had four courses that were um, liberal arts and humanities, and eight courses were from the math and sciences. As I mentioned, we're a centralized design and master course model type of institution. So all of our courses for this project were developed using our normal team. Um, and our normal team consists of a, an instructional designer, a department chair, the librarian, myself, um, a subject matter expert who has a graduate degree with 18 hours in the field, as well as our associate de uh, dean of that area. So um, we had three sets of courses that we looked at for this project. Um, and for the purposes of this brief presentation, I'm gonna go ahead and show you um, the overall um, set of courses. So the 12 courses, um, what their overall effect was on um, zero textbook cost. So if you go to the next slide. So overall looking at academic year 18, um, the, uh, there was a 4.57% increase in pass rates um, for zero textbook cost courses. There was a 3.22% decrease in fail rates and a 1.36% decrease in withdrawal rates. Um, so that was really exciting. There was also a slight increase in our um, enrollment in these courses. Um, and this was that set of, um, there were uh, five courses that we looked at for this section. And then on the next slide, um, there were five courses that were available um, that were actually taught for two full academic years. So academic year 18, which is summer of 17, fall of 17, and spring of 18, and academic year 19, which is summer 18, fall 18, and spring of 19. Um, so that was six consecutive semesters of traditional publisher materials and zero textbook cost materials. Um, so the next slide will show you the effects on that. 
The courses are, um, this was our first course set, so you can see that these aren't exactly the easiest courses. Um, we had two anatomy and physiology courses, a pathophysiology course, an interpersonal communication course, and then intro to sociology. So for those courses, um, comparing academics year 16 and 17, which were the traditional publisher materials, and academics year 18 and 19, um, there was a 6.9% increase in our pass rates, a 6.26% decrease in our fail rates, and a 0.64% decrease in our withdrawal rates. Um, and we looked at over 14,000 students for this. Um, so we're really excited about this personally, even if there were no, um, there was no impact at all on our pass rates or our fail rates or withdrawal rates. Um, I would be thrilled with that as well because, you know, given that all of our students have access to material on day one, um, you know, no impact on, on student success rates or completer rates would be okay with me. Um, but I am beyond thrilled um, that there was such a great increase on our pass rates um, and such a great decrease on our withdrawals and fail rates. So the next steps are on the next slide. Um, one more, sorry. Um, so um, I'm waiting for our academic year 19 data for the second set of courses. Um, I am looking for the, um, the fourth course set data. And then I'm also going to start looking at the qualitative data. So our um, community of inquiry score for teaching and social presence, um, and then also looking at the qualitative student feedback. And I think that's it. Wow, Brittany, those numbers are really exciting. Looking forward to um, learning more about that. Um, all right, so now I'm going to hand it over to James. Um, and James, did you want me? Did you want me to? Um, did you want to share your screen? No, I'm going to go with no slides here. I'm going to be short and sweet. How's that? Okay. Yep. So uh, maybe, well, actually, maybe can you can you back up to the slide that Una shared from uh, OE Global that had all the students on stage? Sure. If that doesn't make people dizzy while you're going back. Uh, but uh, I want to share with everybody uh, what I think is a really uh, exciting and very appropriate uh, trend. Yeah, that was at number 10, I think. Uh, so yeah, the, uh, uh, an appropriate and exciting trend that uh, has developed at uh, these major conferences over the past year or so, um, I, uh, of, and that is of including students. I'm so gratified to, to, to hear all around the country from uh, regional and local events that uh, student panels have become a regular feature of, of uh, holding events uh, around OER, and that's terrific. Uh, it hasn't necessarily until this year really been the case. Uh, uh, with these larger conferences. I remember at uh, the OE Global 2017 conference in Cape Town, uh, a colleague from Ontario, Jenny Heyman, during the closing session, uh, really issued a challenge to uh, all those uh, attending saying, where the heck are the students? Uh, we have to find a way to get more students here. Um, and so I'm very pleased that, uh, to, to say that this is happening. Uh, so let me sh start off uh, with open ed. At open ed, I think uh, uh, there was really there were probably twenty to twenty five different undergraduate students there. Um, I was I'm very fortunate that uh, here in California with our friend Barbara Olowski and with the great support of the Michelson Twenty Million Minds Foundation uh, and our friend Ryan uh, Erickson Kulas, we are able to. Uh, work with a group of eight students, undergraduate students from uh, our state university systems and our community colleges to develop a network of OER advocates. And we were able to support two of those students, one uh, from San Jose State University and one uh, representing College of the Canyons uh, to participate in open ed. And that was really fun and great to see, see the event through their eyes, but even more, uh, the, open, uh, the OpenStax crew had a whole crew of student interns there. I, I can't, uh, I, I don't recall the specific number that they had. I'm going to say six-ish, eight-ish uh, OpenStax student interns were there. Uh, the Maricopa District, the Maricopa Community College District, our host district, had uh, probably half a dozen, if, if, if not more, students there. Um, and uh, they, they were featured in many sessions talking about the way in which 
uh, students are involved in the work that they do uh, at the Maricopa District, both in terms of outreach and advocacy and uh, working alongside academics and faculty to select materials, search for materials, and as we do here at College of the Canyons, uh, include students in our workflow, and they're really the, the engines of our open textbook production here at College of the Canyons. Also, our, our good friends and allies from U.S. PERGS were highly present, uh, Kaylin Nagel and Caitlin Vitez, of course, uh, advocating for students, uh, speaking on behalf of student interest, and, I, and they had at least one student with them, so uh, there was a really strong presence at Open Ed uh, of, of students. And then at OE Global 19 in Milan, you see here on the screen an image of the opening keynote. Our, our conference host, Paula from uh, the Polytechnic of Milan, had, from the very beginning, she envisioned the opening session featuring students. Um, so she was able to uh, invite, identify and invite three students to participate, one on the, on the right-hand side or in the middle of the screen, Robert from Germany. He uh, was speaking about an open pedagogy project that he's initiated at his uh, university. Juliana in the middle there is a computer science student uh, from the Polytechnic of Milan, and she was speaking passionately about the power of open source software. And then Trudy Rodkey from College of the Canyons was speaking uh, powerfully about uh, uh, open education in general, but specifically about the open textbook projects that we have uh, here in the United States. In addition, uh, they participated throughout the entire conference. Trudy uh, from Canyons uh, helped to facilitate sessions with me and Una, and that was a lot of fun to, to see her to see her working, you know, and interacting with everybody. Um, and then colleagues from Nelson Mandela University in South Africa uh, have a project they've entitled Open Ed Influencers, uh, and they had one of their students, Open Ed Influencers, with them, and they're focused on student advocacy. Uh, so there are a lot of different models out there. Some of them are internship models. Some of them are uh, student employment models. Uh, the, the project we have, again, in California with the support of the Michael's 20 Million Minds Foundation, we are paying students and honoring them for their labor. So there are a lot of different models. I encourage you to think about um, how you can, uh, like some other institutions, go beyond the the local and regional events and, and start connecting your students to these larger events. It's at a minimum, it's an incredible opportunity, professional growth opportunity for these young people. But I think in, in the bigger picture, it's a way in which we can responsibly grow our influence and grow our community and think about uh, really enacting our goal, our collective goal of making, making things open by default. Uh, so with that, uh, thanks so much, and uh, I'll close with the, the, the main, one of the thoughts spoken by Robert there uh, on the stage. He said, in the end, trust your students. That was their, their overall message, trust our students. So thanks very much for uh, fiddling with the, uh, with the slides, Sue, appreciate that. Thank you, James. Um, I think we can all agree that having the students present at the conferences conferences and through advocacy is very powerful and really key to, um, like you said, to this movement, keeping it going. Um, so now I'd like to introduce Terry Green and Terry is going to talk about the um, open faculty patchbooks. Well, and Terry was there with a, with a future student. Huh? <laughs> very cute. Um, Terry. So I'm I'm not sure if Terry is with us today, and uh, a lot of us just got, flew home in the last day or so from Milan. Okay. Um, I'm going to put um, the link to um, his project, which is the Open Faculty Patchbooks. Um, it's a it's a collection of faculty work on open on open pedagogy and pedagogy in general in open education. Mm -hmm. And I wonder, um, I, I, I've read some of it, but I'm not, I'm not very familiar with it. And I don't know if anyone else online is, um, is familiar with this. Um, as we know, Terry is up in, um, yeah, thank you for showing that. Uh, Terry is, um, he is at Fleming College um, in um, Ontario, Canada. Um, I think the, this work was at, is actually reflective of, um, educators around the world, but with a big focus on um, Ontario. Um, 
And I know, uh, Rajiv, I know that you're from British Columbia, but you may be a little bit more tied into this. And I wondered if you're still online and maybe you'd like to share something about that. <laughs> I don't know if Rajiv is still with us. Um, he may have had to. Well, while, while he's getting unmuted, perhaps I'll, 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 I will also, this is James again, I will also say that there is an open learner patch book that Terry is curating. Uh, so the idea is that these are, these are living, breathing documents uh, that, that, that uh, uh, grow and expand over time as, uh, as we in the community uh, contribute to them, contribute our story to them. It's a collection of stories. Uh, with no master narrative, hence the the image of the patch book. I hope I'm not not butchering the the, the intent too much. Right. I mean, th there are quite uh, diverse reflections from uh, different educators around the world, and I um, so and this was one of the award winning um, uh, from the OE Global Conference. So um, Terry's Terry's work and. Um, he put together these um, these collections, um, but there's people featured from all over the world. So I hope that this, uh, yeah, <laughs> hope that that URL works, and we'll hope to have uh, Terry join us another time. Thanks, Sue. All right, thank you, Una and James. Um, so Una, would you like to open it up to questions at this time? If anyone has any questions for. Um, for any of the speakers. Um, I think we have a few minutes that we can um, do that before our hour is up. Absolutely, yeah. Um, so you go ahead and um, we, don't, we don't have any questions right now in the chat window, but people okay. can enter those or if you'd like to just unmute yourself, if you'd like to talk about any aspect of these conferences or the future of open ed, please, uh, please do so. Okay, I don't see anyone unmuting, <laughs> so I will um, I'll take that and move on to the next um, slide and wrap things up. Um, so um, if you go to the um, CCC OER website and you click on Get Involved up at the top of the website, um, Liz keeps a nice list of all the OER related um, regional conferences and events. So you can um, take a look at that list from there. You can you know, register for the conferences, submit a proposal. Um, you can also join our community email list if you haven't done so already, which I would say is probably the most dynamic email group I have ever experienced. If you have a question or problem that you're struggling with, you'll receive lots of help, support, resources from our members. Um, and you don't need to be a member to join the community email list. It's open to everyone. Um, the webinar archives are available on the website. Um, so within 48 hours, um, we post a recording of the webinar and the slides so you can access those there and watch them at your own time. Um, and the Open Ed Week call for proposal starts in mid-December. Um, Una, would you like to talk a little bit more about Open Ed Week? Um, sure, I'd be happy to do so. Thank you, Sue. So this is the annual um, big event for sharing um, around the world, um, your project and hearing from other folks. Um, so, um, the submission, the website will open um, the week of December um, 16th. So it, it will be open through mid-February for submissions. And then, um, of course, the event occurs March 2nd through 6th. And there's many ways people use Open Ed. Um, one is simply to find out about all the amazing things that are happening around the world in Open Ed. And Liz, um, our support specialist, will be sending out information um, focusing on North American um, events, but that's not to take away from any of the amazing other events, but just because sometimes the schedule is a little overwhelming. So we tend to send out a, a short little blurb about things that might be of direct interest. Um, but this is also an opportunity for you to download some of the um, 
um, graphic things, the posters that are made available and use it on your campus to create awareness. So many of our um, members do that. Um, they uh, have activities uh, with students around advocacy. They have activities with faculty um, and librarians are often very involved in this. Um, so uh, we'll have more information on that in January. Um, but you can, but we wanted to let you know before, uh, before the end of the year so you can start thinking about what you might want to share, um, any kind of live events that you might want to um, uh, share in terms of webinars and so forth. And we'll, we'll have more guidelines in January that um, if you're new to this. So thank you, Sue. All right. And um, I just saw on the chat that um, Terry has joined us. So if we want to give Terry a few minutes to talk about um, his project and I'll go back to your slide, Terry. Um, and welcome. Um, here we go. Hi. Hi, sorry. Sorry, I'm so late. Um, That's okay. I'm still confused about the time, I think. <laughs> <laughs> the transition. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, so the open patch books, uh, there's two of them. There's the open faculty one and the open learner one. And it's basically a collection of uh, thoughts on how to go about teaching and learning. So each one's written by a different person. And we put out a, a list of topics with the idea that if you were if we got a different person to write on each of these topics we would what would result it would be like a crowdsourced kind of um textbook on how to how to how to teach in college and then the learner one is a, a textbook on how to go about learning um and what was cool about it was that everybody came back with really um situated stories true stories of how they go about like for the learner one, stories about how they go about their reading, how they go about their writing, how they manage their group work, how they um, manage bullying. Even some people still experience bullying in in higher ed. I didn't even realize that. So, um, and then you put it all together, and you have kind of a collection that covers things. And so that was the idea. And so I, from the idea, I just went and kind of sought people out to to contribute, and I still do. Um, so it's an ongoing couple of projects that I'd love to have more um, more contributions from anywhere um, so that's sorry that's the quick and dirty idea of, of what it's all about and it was pretty awesome to get to go to to Milan to to present about it. thank you for sharing that with us Terry and if you'd like to type the um, open learner um, catchbook into the chat that would be great Absolutely. Well, Just give me one I look second. forward to exploring those and learning more about the project. Sounds amazing. And Terry, if people want to contribute, they should just contact you directly using uh, the contact information here. Yeah. Yeah. Great. So there is the URL for open faculty, open faculty patch book. And the faculty one has a, a WordPress site where we collected the stories, but then also a, a press book where we kind of curated into a, a book format. Haven't done that yet with the learner one. And should I put my email in the, oh, it's right there. Yeah. Yep, we have the email. Yeah. All right, thank you, Terry. Thank you, sorry I'm so late. Oh, that's okay. Is it recorded? Oh, cool, I can watch, I can yes. watch later. Yep, all Thanks. right. Um, so, you know, we already talked about Open Ed Week. Um, all right, so our web, our spring webinar series will be um, published and announced in January. And on behalf of uh, CCCOER, um, I hope that everyone has a great end to the semester and a happy holiday season. Um, thank you so much for attending today's webinar. Thank you, Sue. <laughs> All right.